Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. You know, sometimes on the show, we do these like rapid response little interviews where we're like, hey, can you come on the show and talk about the thing that just happened? And sometimes we book our our, our conversations well in advance. Um, and sometimes that works out really, really well, because one of the things that we wanted to do with the month of September was try to have conversations about education, the education system in Alberta. And so we set up like, I don't know, two weeks ago, uh, a chat with the guest that we're going to have on today because we wanted to talk about the education system in Calgary. And then uh, for the record, today is September 19th that we're recording this conversation. Um, and then. A couple days ago, Danielle Smith decided to do some things. And so now we get to talk about those things with somebody who knows a little bit and then some about the things. Very excited to welcome back to the show for another, her second appearance. Uh, none other than the Calgary ATA president for the public school system. Uh, I think I got that all right. I'll find out in a second. Uh, Stephanie Clements. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you, Nate. I'm I'm happy to be back. And, and again, couldn't be more timely. And just to confirm, I am the president for Local 38 of the Alberta Teachers Association, representing Calgary Public Teachers, which is about 10,000 teachers that work for the Calgary Board of Education. So it's a small group. Just a few. <laughs> now, I know, and it, there's some things that I do want to get into, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't start with the wait, what was that uh, announcement that we had from the, the province that came kind of out of the blue to some degree? I mean, I've heard some people speculate, boy, they they scheduled that announcement on the exact same day that city council was voting on the green line. What a what coincidence. But uh, I, I do, to be clear for, for our audience, we are going to get into the the current state of the the education system. We are going to get into this current state of classrooms. We're going to talk about the current situation for teachers because that's what we booked this thing for in the first place. But Daniel Smith went and made herself an announcement of an announcement. And teachers went, wait, what? Because on the heels of the announcement of the announcement, there was also an announcement. This is getting so meta. Uh, that there was going to be a teacher's town hall. And a bunch of teachers went, wait, what? So before we get into what Danielle Smith and the UCP have announced and the changes that they're making to how schools, buildings, to be clear, are provided in Alberta, what was the reaction from like for yourself, for your membership when out of the blue, hey, there's this big announcement and we're about how we're going to help families. And then, oh, by the way, it's totally education centered. Uh, what was what was your sense of it? What was the reaction from the, the people that you represent that you heard? You know, it's interesting because we got the we knew we knew there was going to be the announcement, uh, you know, at the end of the uh, the end of the news hour, supposedly and that. But then all of a sudden there's there's going to be something about teachers and they're having a teacher town hall. So then I was working with our political action chair um, who who's very interested in politics as they you know, chair political action as a committee of, of our teachers. And and we're we're freaking out because what are they going to announce in you know provincially that they need to talk to teachers or have a question and answer period with teachers? Is it you know are they going to make and, and with this government you never know. So are they going to make changes to our um, you know certification rules? Are they going to make changes to how sorry how um, you know. Uh, Funding and event, you know, we don't know, but we were worried because, well, if you've lived in Alberta for any amount of time, you know that it could be anything. And so um, we, and, and the fact that it was such a short turn, turnaround that you had to register to to be a part of the town hall by eleven that next morning for the four thirty town hall, or you didn't get a chance. And so we're, you know, well, of course you want to get in. Well, teachers teach, and and how are we going to get this message out? And so we're re really lucky that that was able to be shared uh, with our teachers, at least in in Calgary, um, in the Catholic and public boards. It was said, you know, sign up. But uh, there, I'm sure there were a lot of teachers who were kind of caught off guard and didn't hear about it. I I want to clarify because one of the things that we were told about 
the announcement of the town hall was that it was specific for certified teachers. Is, was that what was communicated to you? Because this is where I think it gets to be a little bit nuanced and complicated, because in order to work in the, the public system, so we're talking about the the public system, the Catholic system and some charter systems, but not really, uh, you have to be a certified teacher. There are private schools and charter schools that have people who aren't certified teachers. Am I right on that? Yeah, so a certified teacher means that you are licensed and sort of you have a certificate that you've met criteria in Alberta to teach at a public charter or francophone school, and that's that you have an ed degree and you're you are a teacher. Now, um, there are some cases where if you're if you don't have that certification, I mean, you, you can't teach in any, you can't teach curricula. But so there was worry that you know are there, you know, are you early childhood teachers, et cetera. Um, and the the original email that went out by the minister um, and sent to the stakeholder associations or groups, um, it just said, you know, teachers, administrators, and other education staff. Okay. And teachers was a focus, um, but other education staff could have been at, at assistance or whatever. But we were worried because it looked, it was specific to teachers. So what what is the announcement and how is that going to play out to to teachers? Yeah. And the announcement comes and it was kind of almost anticlimactic in a way because there was all of this this anxiety. And I know that the 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 social media sphere was going, wait, what? Um, because of the the town hall and because of the the vague nature of what had been uh, communicated, what was going to be announced and all of that. And the announcement comes and it's basically the premier says, hey, everybody, um, first of all. Justin Trudeau is just the worst. Also, these immigrants, man, I don't even know. But uh, we're going to change how school buildings are built. So this is not funding for students. This is not funding for student programming. This is not funding for anything other than putting bricks on top of each other. Uh, what was your, I mean, what are your big takeaways We'll do the town hall later because that was a whole separate shit show. But uh, what were your takeaways from the the announcement? You know, it's interesting. So the the announcement was at six fifty. So we we had a, a committee meeting that night. So we made sure to finish early so everyone could get home and be safely, you know, ensconced in front of a whatever screen to hear the announcement. And then and then we heard the pre recorded video of you know of commentator daniel smith say about you know families and whatever and then and then we're texting each other like wait what like yeah that's great there's no schools and then we're thinking about it a little bit more i'm like wait private schools charter schools being funded okay well and we knew um by that point we knew that there was going to be another announcement the next morning like a, a presser was happening at western canada high school at 9 30 so we knew that was happening so we're like okay well maybe there's something more specific about teachers that are going to be made there and not in this pre-recorded, you know, 10 minute announcement. So um, still not totally loss of the anxiety, but we were, you know, a couple of us were like, what I just spent a whole afternoon seeking chocolate in the office because of this. And, and now I'm like, well, you know, okay, and then where are the schools? And I think you, 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 you touched on a really important piece here because they have not provided any percentages other than, oh, I'm sure it'll be the vast majority will be public, um, but they haven't provided any numbers in that announcement or in that presser. And we still haven't gotten to the town hall yet, uh, but they haven't provided any numbers in that announcement or the presser in regards to what the specific breakdown of this eight billion dollars and change in building funding, the, the brick funding, not the program funding uh, is where that's going to go they've said that it's going to go to public schools they've said that it's going to go to charter schools which are kind of sort of public but we'll talk more about that later and uh they oh, oh and private because we believe in in choice and education and there's a lot of pundits who are looking at this and going is this just a way of backdooring in way more funding for private schools what's your what's your take on that well if you look at if you look at the funding 
model. And this, I mean, when I talk about the funding model I, of students, and it's interesting that in this announcement that they didn't, they did, they mentioned schools, you know, there'll be 90 schools, but they really focused on the number of seats. It's going to be 200,000 seats for students. And so, you know, and 12,500 seats for um, charter schools, you know, that completely doubles the number of students in charter schools, because that's how many we have right now. Um, but they weren't, they weren't clear on that. And, and you're right. So um, during the press release, um, at at the high school on the on the Wednesday morning, they mentioned, um, you know, we're going to we, we're going to fund 10 schools right away. Like we're going to have them going right away. And then we're going to but we're going to have 90 schools in the next three years. That's going to be a lot of ribbon cutting right around an election time. Interesting enough. Oh, look at that. Um, but they didn't say where they didn't say, you know, the review. So. Who, who knows what it's going to look like? Like 96, it might be down to 95% of students in this province attend public schools. And and so, yes, you have your five percenters. And, and you know, when most people think of private schools, they, they picture like Strathcona Tweedsmere and your, you know, your uniform. And the mass, the majority of the independent schools, as our, our premier likes to say, I call private schools, um, are actually like religious um funded, focused, smaller schools in the basement of the church, et cetera, or you know, religious-based um, academies in, in the province. And then we do have some special ed. And that's a question I want to talk about later as well, make a note, um, because specifically what um, Minister Nicolaitis talked about and how, you know, this benefits our public or our private institutions where you can support more students with complex needs, which is wrong. So, um, Anyway, I, I lost the question. Uh, well, it was just like, um, I guess what 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 the the high level question is yeah, how how like I'll put it this way: when I was listening to the announcement, my initial reaction was, okay, but what are they doing here? Because it seemed like there was a, a vague. A, a, a big number, we're going to throw out a really big number in regards to how much we're contributing to education, kind of, sort of. Um, but we're not going to specify how much of that big number is going to go towards private slash charter facilities. And the, I guess the question that I want to get at is there's also another major change baked into this announcement because historically my understanding is that the province builds a school and then they go, here you go, CBE or Edmonton board of education. Uh, I don't know if it's called the EBE. It should be, that would be phonetically oh. fun. Um, but, uh, and then that building becomes the, the possession and property of those school boards. The way that, the UCP and Daniel Smith are kind of playing with the numbers on this is in order to not really have spent the money, they're going to be counting all of the buildings that they build for schools as buildings still owned by the province. And this has some pretty big implications, I think, in a lot of different ways. And the that's sort of where I wanted to kind of explore with you, because Daniel Smith just recently was talking about, hey, you know what, in my uh, home constituency, air quoting that aggressively for the audio listeners, um, they, they're, they're talking about using the school after hours for all of these other programs. And there's all of these other uses that the school buildings could have. And I kind of wonder if the the province is going to be the ones owning the building and counting them as uh, capital on the balance sheets in order to say, well, we didn't actually spend the money. We just built a building with the money and we still own the building. How much is there any concern into what role they're going to play into the operations of those buildings? Well, and I think it it depends that definitely was a, a mix now that you know we're not only we're going to fund it and then you have to build it and and i believe that all of the new builds in the last few years have been overseen by um infrastructure alberta public infrastructure works or whatever one of the one of their that lead minister spoke um at the press release as well um 
but so go back a few years when we had a whole bunch of P3 schools and um, we joke that, you know, they were managed or, or I don't, does the school board own them? I think so. But then they're managed by a separate company like Honeywell. And so you couldn't, you know, like, Hey, it's really cold in here. It's a cold day. Someone didn't turn the, you actually have to like email the other company to say, Hey, Honeywell, can you turn my heat up two pieces or whatever? Um, which just adds another piece of, you know, administrivia to the work that you're trying to do as a teacher. Um, so now you've got schools that the government builds them and owns them and leases them to, you still have full control over that. And so there's some worries because if you know this government and you know that, you know, they, if they have something to hold above your head to say, well, I don't like how you're doing things, or we think you're mismanagement, whatever, then, you know, maybe we'll just take the school and give it to Calgary Catholic, or maybe we'll give it to, you know, Rundle or somewhere or some private entity that could do a better job than you. I, I think reminiscent of Covenant Health and et cetera. Like, so there, there is some worry about that. The other big piece is that now the big change, which is that shell game is that now we're potentially going to see the government use their capital to build private schools. So not only are you funding the students in that school, 70% of the amount that you give a student who's in, in the public system, you're now also going to build a building for them. And so now they say independent, not for profit. Well, I, I want to know what that means. I want to know, you know, is Weber Academy, which has billions of dollars in their investment funds. I mean, is that a not-for-profit school? You know, is it for the good of the kids? Well, I have so many issues with, with private schools in, in that. So we're, now we're building the schools for them. We've got a billion dollar maintenance backlog in Calgary Board of Education alone. We've got, you know, I can't remember the number, how many schools about 50 years old. And, you know, by, you know, 10 more years, we're going to have, you know, 70% of our schools over 50 years old. And, and you know that the things that were built, those schools that were built 100 years ago, 50 years ago, are actually still kind of holding up better than the ones that were built 10 years ago, because quality of all, you, you know what I'm implying. Yeah. So, but those schools that are older, they, they need you know, abatement of asbestos we have in some of our buildings because of the age. You've got, you know, things fall apart after time, especially when you've got 600 youngins running through the building like those. So I believe it was announced last year at a, at a board of trustees meeting when they present to the government, you know, here's our capital, here's, here's our absolute needs. And I have to give kudos to our Calgary board of education and their facility services. Cause they, they do all of the, like, it is very clear. This is where the growth is. This is the projection. These are the schools that need to be built. Uh, these are the schools that need to be maintained or, or fixed. And these are the ones that we can, they'll still get by. But but that's a billion dollar that isn't being put into schools because we're just trying to deal with the number of kids that we have in front of us. So, um, you know, the yes, it's great. And I know our provincial president, Jason Schilling, said the same thing. Yes, it's great to know that there are schools that are coming because our population is growing. But how does that help the kids today? How does that help the students who are still being crammed into a portable that we finally get a chance? You know, yes, we're going to move the portable and that will, or sorry, modular, they call them modulars now. Uh, you know, they're they're doing things to appease the the space issues that we're having, but it's a little too little like they created the problem so it's yeah. not like going to fix it so that goes back to a kind of a bigger question of hey the timing of this um what else you know is there anything coming up is there anything that you want to deflect from it could be the green line and that debacle you could be trying to secure some votes for you know november the beginning of November. you know hey look at me i give money to schools i'm popular like there's there's so many political reasons for doing this that it it just doesn't feel genuine yeah and i think i, I want to talk a little bit about the 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 not-for-profit independent private school thing like i can open correct me if i'm wrong but if i wanted to uh, i don't i'm not going to i would do a terrible job of it but if i wanted to open nate's private school for youngsters or something riffing on the x-men a bit there uh 
I could do that. And as long as the organization doesn't make a profit, then I'm a non-profit. I can pull down a million five in a salary if I so choose to um, and spend most of my time vacationing whilst I pay my employees pennies. I can do that and still qualify as a non-profit. And so I, I think this is part of the concern that some people have voiced over the last couple of days is that when we're talking about the oversight that exists for especially the private schools, but also to some degree, the charter schools, uh, it is not a, that oversight is not a public component. Charter schools uh, get appointed or a, they have their own internal own internal process for who gets on their board. Whereas somebody, if you want to be on the board for the CBE or the Calgary Catholic or Edmonton Catholic or, 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 or you got to run an election and it's the people in the area that you're going to represent that get to choose you because we're talking about taxpayers money. So there should be some public accountability. But if we're talking about charter schools, I can't vote for the, the board of a charter school unless my kids go there. And I certainly can't vote for the president of Nate's school for youngsters um, unless I'm the person running it. So there's a, there's a tremendous difference in the accountability piece that I think is poorly understood. And I think that's part of the, the question, why is the province directing a, an unspecified amount of taxpayer dollars uh, to these organizations that have very, very limited public oversight. The, you know, when you think about before the extent of, of how many charter schools could, how many charters were available in the province changed, because I believe it used to be there were 13 and that was it. And you could not have any more. I think maybe 14, there were, you could have 14 and, and there was no one that had put forward their name for that. And then the UCP changed that. And I mean, if you look at what was the purpose of having a charter, because public education should serve everyone. And so if you were a group of parents and and said, you know, my child is not being served in in the public system, so we need to fix something. Well, and they had to write that letter or do the application to the school board in the area where you were to say, look, we're not being met, you know. So I think of, um, you know, one of the new ones that came up in the last couple of years, like there's the science, like the STEM science academy, and there's other um, schools, you know, for students who are gifted. And the, so these specializations, well, I mean, I can't speak about the, the Catholic system because I don't work in it, but, um, you know, we have programs for students who are who are gifted. We have programs for students who or parents want to focus on science and STEM. We have traditional learning centers, which are, um, you know, more of a traditional idea of, you know, your desks, your uniforms, their, your type of learning. So all of these things that have been created within the public system to provide choice to the parents of, of the community. And, and in so many cases, these spaces are in your neighborhood or there's a bus provided. It's not, you know, you're the closest school to you that is a TLC school is in this area. So, and there's a bus you pay. So, I mean, so you need a charter school because, um, so the Calgary Islamic school, like that is a charter school. We and our system, we don't have, you know, the CBE, I say we, but I mean, the CBE doesn't have, you know, Islamic school program as a religious program so you know what that makes sense then get your charter get people on the board and and don't charge any money and and if if a student who lives close by and doesn't meet the criteria if anyone who who applies should be able to go you should not be able to turn anyone away from a public school because it, you're a public entity well one of the problems that we see in my background before becoming in this political realm was in special education and so we have you know over 22,000 of our 143,000 students in the Calgary Board of Education that have some sort of coding. They have some sort of um, special note, whether it's medical or cognitive or, 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 and, and, you know, we welcome everyone. We're an inclusive system. We're not funded. We're not resourced appropriately to do it right. And that's not for lack of trying. But then you have schools. So there's a there's a couple of schools here, private schools in Calgary that focus on students with autism. And, you know, that's there. So with smaller class sizes, they've got the medical connection, but they charge money for that. And it's, you know, if you if you have a child with autism, but you don't have 
funding, then then you get what you get. And and I, you know, the the programs that we have in our in our school board, um, and we do have specialized classes. We do have, you know, or or an inclusion. You know, we are obligated to provide the supports. It might not be exactly what the parent wants. So if if I'm a parent and I want my child to have a, a one to one support, an EA, an education assistant that stays with my child, well, that's you know, we have targeted adult supports. And so that means that you, you know, I'm going to support you, but I'm not for you. I'm I'm for everyone in the room and I'm going to do what I can do. So, but if I have $40,000 a year or 27 or whatever the amount is, I can pay that extra money, which provides that support, but it's not fair to the family down the road that needs the same support or feels they need the same support and doesn't have the money. So why are you benefiting this this place and going to I mean I know I'm touching on the town hall but you know Minister Nicolades said you know these are great opportunities that we can provide more spaces for students with special needs you should be providing those in public schools so you're not only limiting you know the people that are able or live in a certain area that can afford to go there going back to the comment about charter schools so yes, you're not publicly accountable. You have a board, but they're not voted on by the citizenry. And you have, um, you know, you can focus your school. So let's say you're saying we're a gifted school. So does that mean that if I come in and my IQ is 127, I can't get in because I went gifted is 150, you know? So I'm sorry, you can't come. Or um, as we see in, as we see in the schools that are charter schools that are supposed to be open to everyone, and but you come in and you have a behavioral coding, you have the inability to self-regulate for whatever reason, whatever reason you go to school and then they can't they they can't help you. They they can't like we don't have the we don't know how to support you. You're interrupting our class of happy harmonious kids working here. So sorry, like they end up getting pushed out back into the public system. So you can turn kids away. You can say no, sorry, you're not. Um, you need to have an IQ of whatever to get into our school. Well, that's not, that's, that's elitist. And so I can't, <laughs> excuse me, I can't say it. So why should it be okay for the school down the road? Yeah. And I think one of the other, like, <clears throat> I think one of the, the core arguments that gets out there is if we were making sure that the public system had the supports and the programs appropriately funded in place, then perhaps there would be a different conversation about directing funding towards charter schools. I think people would still be pretty squirrely about the private ones unless they've got their kids in private school. But the the reality of the situation is right now we do not have appropriate funding for the, the public system to provide those services. And there is some inequity that exists in regards to who gets to access the programming that their kids need. We just did a whole episode with Hold My Hand that that horrifyingly emphasized that point. And it seems like the province is going, well, yeah, but we really want to help the rich people. So that's what we're going to we're going to do before we move to the town hall, though. There is one other piece that I wanted to to get your thoughts on, because it's something that has come up in a couple of different places. And that is if the province is building these buildings and they are keeping them as provincial property and they give them to private, uh, nonprofit, independent, whatever schools, that makes the, the province a stakeholder in those schools in a very fascinating way because you know as there's similar concerns for um the the public schools that would be owned by the province and maybe the province says hey we really want to open up the school in the evening for uh political debates uh so we're we're going to say we're going to open these up and there are buildings so na 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 um there is a question of leverage on um religious groups and on cultural groups and in some cases new canadians where the government now has some leverage on those groups being able to access their programs and that creates a power dynamic that is a little fraught because if i'm daniel smith 
um, and I'm able to live with myself, then I, you know, I can go to Jerry's fundamentalist Christian school and say, yeah, it's a really nice school you got there. Really important to make sure you support the the folks that got it for you, right? Uh, I've got this leadership review coming up. And, uh, you know, if you want to keep this school or if you want me to build it for you, uh, it would sure be great if I could count on your support. And I have not seen anything to address. Like, no, you can't do that. Well, and and I and I can't speak to that because I, I see I see where you're going and I see where there's that potential. I think of the comment that was played on the news this morning in the review of, of going back to the green line where where our premier was like, well, you know, we we. We just can't not, you know, if we see a problem that needs to be fixed, then we're going to we're going to fix it. And I think our province appreciates that that we step in. And if things are not being done the right way, that we'll just do that. We'll do it the right way. That was what Danny said specifically about the green line. We'll transpose that into the school or the hospital. We don't think it's done the way we want to do it. We're going to come in and and it's a bit scary. It's a bit um, it's a bit too close to to what what a government should be doing and that arms reach from the actual services that it provides. And that resonated with me as I'm driving to work this morning, going, put that into how many other contexts it's scary. Um, let's talk about the town hall. Cause that was wild. Um, a, I, I'm curious if you see a connection that required the town hall for teachers given that we're talking about purely infrastructure and nothing to do with classroom supports, nothing to do with teachers' wages, nothing to do with any of the stuff that's going inside in the classroom or per capita spending per student or, 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 or was like, am I, I'm not a teacher. I'm also by many people's accounts, not that bright. Am I missing something or was there like no discernible connection between the two things? So funny enough, um, Last night was our our executive committee meeting. We started at four forty five, and and this is these are the the teachers that work full time that that give up their time to give back to their profession to their professional association. You know the the chair of the political action committee, the chair you know of our trustee or sorry our, our treasurer or you know etc. And and coming in together to meet to do the work of supporting our members. And so we we set up the call so we could all listen. Um, we could ask a question. We had one person um, it, in it, on the phone, essentially. And and so we're all waiting. We're having our meal before, you know, our meeting would have started at 4.45. So it's 4.30. And we're listening to the blathering on. And then, like, we were looking around at each other saying, like, what, what does this have to do with us? What, you know, it, it, it then I'm like, oh, wait, this clearly seems like an opportunity to a you know say we've spoken with the teachers of Alberta and they you know they heard us we answered their questions and b here's an opportunity to it it felt weird it it did feel weird and then even the questions i'm so proud of my of my colleagues around the province that you know i recognize some of the voices and i i recognize some of the names from different parts of the province asking questions and when they asked questions about were the lowest funded um our students are the lowest funded in canada and that's you know of course Minister Nicolades was like, well, those numbers are really old. Like, I'm like, well, you're throwing out numbers from 2022s, and but that's okay. But if I say it's the 2122 Stats Canada that you're underfunding our students by a, a landslide compared to other provinces, you know, and, and then someone even asked, and you know, and I think Daniel Smith weighed in and said, you know, well, you know, we're that that's old data. We're we're, you know do we want to be like where I'm like, no, we want to be like Quebec. We want to be the highest amount of funding. We want our students to, and this has been chronic. And, and even it, it was, I felt like it was, here's an opportunity for us to turn it to, this is how, this is what you should be saying. This is what the truth is. This is what we're doing. Look, we're giving back to education. We paid and, you know, they kept said the amount of money teachers don't care if there's new schools. Teachers just want to know that they don't have 36 kids in their grade three class and and no ed assistant to help support the 17 kids that that 
desperately need the support. Um, and so it actually, we got to about five o'clock and then I looked around and I'm like, do we need to keep listening to this? And they're like, no, we're done. So we, we, we hung up and then we started our meeting and someone stayed on and checked. I'm like, did we miss any? No, we didn't miss anything. It was sorry. It's funny, but it's true. Um, but I imagine the, the big good news that, uh, that was broken and I'm really being sarcastic right now. Uh, but the big good news that was broken in that town hall was that the education system has only been in crisis for the last 18 months, which is wild because uh, I was looking back at our back catalog and we last spoke with you about the education system being in crisis 11 months ago. <laughs> and so... <laughs> didn't just start seven months before I had that conversation with you. And even the comment that when they're talking about, you know, we have to do this now because of the explosion of population that's, you know, since 2022 and that, you know, from 2014 to 20, whatever that, you know, we were in decline. I saw someone shared the chart. Like we have been growing as a province in size and number of students forever. We, we've we not dropped. The only drop that happened was in 2021 when when students disappeared uh, because of COVID, th that they didn't actually register, like the number of students that disappeared in school boards uh, across the province where it was actually kind of surprising because then the next year, all of a sudden you get an extra 5,000 students in Calgary. Like they were here all along. They just, they were hiding at home essentially. So it, yeah, it, it's only been educational problems for 18 months. Interesting. <laughs> I love I, I, that was my my personal favorite from the whole thing was the well, we've only really had problems in education. Everything's been fine up until the last 18 months. And then the the dog whistle to the it's all these newcomers. I mean, a year ago, less than a year ago, Daniel Smith re upped the whole um, Alberta is still calling uh, my favorite Twitter account. Weighed in with that today with the clips from the legislature. Uh, and so there's no question like. I just really want to take a moment to highlight for all of the ridiculous things that have happened in the last week, saying that the Alberta education system is only been in crisis for the last 18 months has to be hands down the dumbest comms line that uh, that has been thrown. And there's been some dumb comms lines that have made its way onto a bunch of different microphones. But to suggest that teachers have been fine up until 18 months ago is. <laughs> I just I can't. I, I, believe I got a Facebook memory from 10 years ago where it was <laughs> like our classes are over full. We don't have supports like this is, it's it's I think chronic is a word that could be applied versus new. Yeah, it's and and this is where I was, you know, now that we've spent half an hour talking about the last five days, um, this is where I wanted to kind of get to because it is a chronic problem. And there are the same problems that have persisted, not for 18 months, but for years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about a bunch of these when we sat down last time. I'm talking about things like the administrative burden. I'm talking about things like classroom sizes. I'm talking about things like student complexity. And those things have not gotten any better, I think. This is where I want to check in with you. So we're going to go through each of those things. Um, let's start with the administrative burden. I bugged uh, Mr. Schilling about this a little bit because my impression is that the administrative burden is bad and that it's only about to get worse because they're implementing the the, the pronoun policies um, there and, and for the, as a follow-up, I did tell my kids, they're only allowed to change their names a couple of times this year, uh, cause civil disobedience is good, but teachers are uh, dealing with a lot. Um, but there is the administrative burden that's going to come with that. There's also the administrative and moral burden that's going to come with the uh, other horrifying policies. What are you hearing from your members about the current state of the administrative burden? And before you answer that, for anybody who didn't catch our conversation, what is administrative burden? Excellent question. Um, so if I'm the administrator of a school and the principal and the assistant principal, I I am the, the instructional leader of the school. So I have um, expectations that I am um, 
guiding the teachers and other staff in the school to be following the policies of the school board and to be making sure you're following the curriculum. You're making sure, I mean, teachers have a professional code of conduct that is when they become a member of the profession, you're expected to do your job and do it well and, and treat kids with dignity and respect and, and, and do your job. And, and now if you're an administrator, your expectation is to you know, guide that. You want to be a, a instructional leader where you're you're showing. You know, you're leading the way. You're also checking the boxes off of your your list of of what you do. You know, the school board says, well, you need to have a school development plan, and that has to include these things. And your teachers have to be involved in creating it. And you have to make sure you're following the education plan. So these are these are overreaching the guides. And then, but you also need to build that school just you want to build a place where people want to come and learn every day and you want to manage people and like managing people, whether it's 700 students and, and 50 staff, I mean, you're dealing with emotions, you're dealing with people who get sick and having family crises and you're having kids who are there's, you're just, you're in charge, you're in charge of all of that. And while we have staff to help do the work, you know, you have, a secretary at the front of the school administrative assistant who will, you know, answer the calls to take the notes for the kids who were sick that day, but, and, and hand out the ice because we don't have nurse, you know, like there's the administrator still oversees all of that, but then add automatic changes to legislation. Well, that hasn't happened yet. We know yet is a scary word and, you know, and, making sure your staff and students know that, you know, we're, we're a family here. I'm going to support you. And, and then, but then you've got like a dashboard where you have to like, there's too many people sick. Do I need to make sure, like, do I have to call that to public health? Do I have, um, is my building falling apart? Is I've got, um, the, the rentals in the school. So I've got, you know, there's three different basketball leagues that are coming in. So I need to make sure that my caretaking team is aware of that like, so there's just so many things that is your job there's only so many hours in the day and then you add the paperwork piece and and over the last I, I think we talked about this briefly when we met last time but you know through technology while there are benefits to technology there are also extra job duties the data entry like you have to take all the things and enter it into like that is the, even you know my my poor principal friends who um for example I know we'll talk about the the um assessments that, I mean, we've been doing assessments, the government have mandated assessments post COVID. And, you know, one of my, one of my principal friends from elementary school, she's like, I took the whole weekend and entered in the scores of all 600 kids in this. It took her a full weekend of her time that she'll never get back because if she didn't do it, it's her teacher or her administrator, or her learning leader. And so, and our, and our administrators, I mean, the teachers do what they do because they love what they do. They, they want to support kids. They want to see the growth and learning, but our administrators also wear so much on their own shoulders so that those teachers that are dealing with the 36 kids in their grade two class are, are barely hanging on. So we're going about things that haven't changed. It's that, that exhaustion it's not like we haven't had a chance to take a, a break and, and our, our poor administrators, I think, are wearing it the most because there's no time limit on their instruction. A teacher has a, a you have so many hours of assignable time that you can be assigned in a week and, and in the year. But if you become a leader, if you sign up and have an administrative title, that doesn't account for you anymore. So you you just have to keep working till the job's done. And that that's a lot. And it spills over my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is there's a lot of that business and the, the, the not teaching part that spills down onto teachers as well. I mean, Mr. Schilling made a joke about, I didn't become a teacher to learn how to do data, data entry in power school. Um, and I think that that's, you know, another piece that is, is lost in all of this because there are, you know, I, I th my impression, and I could be wrong, is that teachers become teachers because they want to teach kids to do the things um, and not so much because teachers want to do the the data entry stuff. And I mean, it's fantastic that there's principals like the one that you mentioned who are saying, I don't want my teachers to have to do all of this stuff. But if there's a principal who isn't doing that, then it is it, that falls on the teacher and that takes away from the the teaching time. Oh, 
absolutely. And that's another conversation altogether about like, you have so many hours to teach the curriculum, which equals so many hours. And then if you're taking that time away because you have to administer you know, assessments or, or et cetera, like those things take time. But I think what people don't realize, you know, you, a, a very common public belief about teachers is, oh, it's an easy job. I was in a classroom. I could do it you go to work at eight in the morning, you're done at three 30, like whatever. That's only the public facing part of a teacher's job. I mentioned it before that once the door closes and the kids are gone at the end of the day, now you have to do all the marking, all the planning, all of the reporting, all of the assessment. Um, and, and now with again, that technology. So you've given an assessment that you're trying to reach, you know, have these students met, can they do these things? So you've given them an assessment, whether it's a project, whether it's writing, whether it's a sample, or they even email you. So then you have to go through and what used to be the teacher making notes on the paper and, and you know, handing it back. Well, now it's that's got to be uploaded into PowerSchool, which is what we use in our system, where, you know, find the STEM for social studies and, you know, respect that there are different identities in Canada. OK, well, they showed the mentioned, you know, consider so yes they have done i can check those off maybe I put a little comment in there so that when their parents go and log on they can see oh yeah they've you know so there's different levels of that well then report card time comes well now you have to go and look did they get all the things and then make a you know areas of strength areas for growth and uh and you know next steps or whatever so like there's just so many things well i have um teachers who have spent 50 hours doing report card comments and entering those in. That's just, and that's out after the 3.30, that's the weekend, that's the whole Christmas break. That's um, that's not ever thought about. You know, you get summers off, well, you're just catching up with all the work and prepping for the next year. So you yeah. can have summers off too. You just don't get paid. Like that's how it works. We don't get paid in the summer, so. And, I'm, you know, as you say that, I'm curious with the the power school and the, the I have two kids that are going to school. And I remember when back when I was young, um, I had to, like, bring home stuff and have my parents sign it. And I, I would legitimately be curious if anybody's tracking what the what the parental engagement on things like power school is, because I only I'm a bad bad person but i only ever log in to look at the power school stuff when i get like an email being like hey you need to look at these things because it's just the the login process and navigating the whole thing creates so many barriers to entry whereas like you know when i was a kid and i had to take my report card home and get it signed and dread all of the why did you not go to any of these classes um there was it was i have i had to get my parents to sign that and that's a that's a whole other that's probably a whole other FOIP rabbit hole. But um, so that's the the administrative, the 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 burden, the the business of running a classroom for both the administrators and the teachers that has not gotten better. And just to be clear, that's been a problem for more than 18 months, right? Sure has. Sure has. Um. Let's talk about classroom sizes then, because this is, again, you know, we're getting no shortage of DMs here uh, where we're hearing from teachers and we're hearing from parents talking about the fact that they've got, uh, you know, there's fit at phys ed classes in South Calgary that have over 50 students involved in them. There's there's classrooms. The, the ATA has released a couple of different stats on the available data, which, again, is important to be clear because the, the province said, man, eh, maybe if we don't track the class sizes so much anymore then it won't be a problem we can just la 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 um what are you hearing from your membership about class sizes are they getting better are they getting worse um i what we're hearing is that they are they're still big they're still um i mean it, it it's hard to tell at this point so we're we're the the 19th of september we know that it's the end of the month where you have that count so this month the last day with kids will be the september 26th so on that day you know all the students that are registered in your school are officially counted and all the codes and all the things that are sent to to edmonton um and so hey guess what? School boards are actually sending all of this data to the government because they have to. It's just not being collected officially in one felt document. So if the government really wanted to report on how 
how full our classrooms are, they could get it. Anyway, that's a but political will. Um the 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 kids in the classroom, there's still some shifting around. Uh, one of the things that we're hearing about, especially in Calgary, because we are so chock full, is that, you know, you um, you live in a community and you register to go to the, the elementary. Uh, that's where you live. And, and the elementary says, well, sorry, actually, um, we are we're full now. Um, we can't have more in this school. So then you you need to go and register at, at this next school. And then um, but then a week later, you get a call, a recall of seven students from that school. No, actually, we do have rooms so to go back. So there's there's a lot of shuffling around because, you know, it, the it's all based on your your projections this is what you project your school is going to be at how many kids are actually through the door they're still shuffling around but that number will be based uh, as of a week from today um so you may qualify for additional funding uh because of the numbers that actually show up and then uh, so october 3rd you get uh, a new teacher to teach in the grade five so then the grade fives that are there that are 35 kids get split so ask me that question in a month but to until and then until but until administrator knows at the school what the numbers are going to look like you don't want to hire someone and have a teacher and then say oh sorry I was wrong you know I you, you gotta have to go somewhere else like that's that's tough on teachers as well and and that does happen there is some shift and there is some movement and and hiring and and we have um we have lots of teachers on our substitute teacher roster and they can be hired into temporary contracts because once your year starts like you yeah we'll fill we've got you for the end of the year so class sizes are still there's still tons of kids in schools and they're still uh, you, someone said that they got a, another grade five teacher so they're actually only had 23 in their class so that was nice they're starting off it was it was good but that was at one school because they happened to have you know but but next year, be careful because the classes are 34. So, you know, you're going to you might be living it up this year, but next year you're getting it. So it, it it's really hard to say. And we have 251 schools in Calgary Board of Education and and that you're going to get a variety across the way. Uh, what I'm hearing from teachers, I'm hearing um, that they and maybe I'm jumping ahead because I know you were going to ask about the assessments and stuff because that it came in. I think we talked about it last time, but now the government has said in the secret summer announcement when no one was listening, surprise, we're going to test everyone every year because testing is amazing. And clearly you can see how well everyone's doing if you test them, which if you applied to healthcare, you know, hey, I'm not feeling well. Here's a test. Oh, you have cancer. I'm not going to provide you any supports for your cancer. I'm just going to test you every year to tell you you have cancer until six years from now. Anyway, uh, not appropriate. But also testing kids that much is not appropriate. Um, and here is an example that just irks me. So uh, teachers assess students all the time. That is that is our job. We want to know where's your baseline? What do you need help with? And then we move you forward. And then we then we assess you again. We test you again and say, okay, you've, you've learned these skills. That's awesome. We need to work on this one. That's what we do. That's our job. And so, and and there's a monetary piece of it because who, who created the assessment? Do you have to buy it? Is there a company somewhere that's making bank because you're now saying that 46,000 students in a system, whatever, need to, whatever. So, what's behind the assessment and how did they choose the ones that they chose? So for example, in a school board that I happen to know well, um, they trained early learning, early um, elementary teachers on a specific system that is to assess students kind of as a pre-learning and becoming learners on, on how they're doing. And so like, are you ready to read? Do you, what do you know? And so lots of money spent on the program to, all teachers had to take the training and training is time and um and it had been doing well they could look and see how the kids were benefiting especially then they moved into grade one etc um guess what test isn't on that list of approved assessments the one that all of our L L early elementary teachers are ready to do i'm like and so i'm going to make a decision at the top i'm not going to consult the people that are doing the work because maybe that, I don't know, maybe that assessment isn't sold by your buddy. I don't know the story behind it, but 
it, it's politics need to stay at a at a school so teachers can do their job. The other the other ones that are you know I call it testing for dollars. So um, post COVID, there were a number of tests that you were you know to give to grade one students, and they're like basic numeracy, basic math. They're not great tests, but like here's a baseline. Well, okay, so now everyone has to do that, and everyone has to do this this week. And everyone has to get that data into the computer before next Thursday, because we're going to fund you based on that. And so then we're going to give you money and then, but we're only going to give, you'll get the money like by May. And then you have no time to actually do anything to help the kids that are behind. And so now you have kids who are moving into grade six, you know, that are still behind because they missed out on some key components during COVID and they're still behind. And you know how much that sucks in grade six when you're a lagging reader, like that's your whole mental health. That's, but anyway, the system is broken. You can't over test a kid and then not offer any supports other than, you know, we gave some money. Here's, here's, you know, a million dollars. Well, how is that going to get into every classroom? So um, it, it's frustrating and, um, and our teachers are overwhelmed. I, I received an email from a teacher who, who said, I don't, and I asked her, I said, take this email and, and send it to your MLA, send it to the MLA of the school that you, the area of the school that you work in. They said that they'd spent, so we're only two and a half weeks into the school year. I know it feels like seven years, but it's only two and a half weeks into the school year. And, and I have grade two teachers saying, I just want to get to know these kids. Like I, I, they're crying because we have to do this test. They don't, you know, if they're grade one, they're not even, pre, they're pre-reading. And then, but so you're making kids feel bad because they can't answer something or they don't know how, I mean, they don't know how to fill out bubble sheets. Like bubble sheets is hard. Like that, like having to do that, that is a whole day's lesson right there. And, and when we don't think about that and we don't think, and so, you know, I, I make you, I, I don't know you, you don't know me very well. I'm welcoming you come into my class and I'm going to give you a, a task that you don't know how to do and write about you. And, and how are you going to feel right? As opposed to what about waiting a month and a half when you've built community in your classroom and your kids are confident, they, they, they can take risks because they, they feel like, you know what, I know I can make a mistake and, and I'm supported. And then what does that look like? But you no, know, it's all timelined and it, yeah, I could, sorry, you know me, I could go on and on. I, I feel like you're not a fan of these tests. I'm so not a fan. And then, because it's not just the test, if it was just one test and you do it and, and you know, it's a baseline, you can do it again at the end of the year and then say, but you're testing for dollars. You're testing to say, you know, how are you doing? And even the whole idea, like it's such an American idea about like standardized tests, which has absolutely ruined education in so many states. And then we have a government who thinks all of these things that happened and failed in the states are are amazing. Let's do it in El, Alberta or Alberta, Bama or whatever you want to call us. That it's you're missing the point. It's not good for kids. It's not. Yes, there needs to be accountability. Well, you don't have to test every kid every year or three times a year to have the accountability that your teachers are doing their jobs. Trust the profession. We went to school for six years or more to do this job. It's not like we're just coming off the street going, oh, I could do this. Well, just, for now. I mean, yeah. there's some policies at the UCP convention. But before we get too far into the the test, farther into the testing piece, and before we address the student complexity piece, and I asked a big question that I'm saving for the very end, uh, there's something that I want to tease out out of what you said there. You referenced that you heard from a teacher who said that they only had, it was 23 kids in a grade five class. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I think it was grade three, but it was a, it was a small class. It was an example of a a small class size because they had enough to hire a teacher to break out the number of kids in a grade. Okay. And this is where I want to do like the frogs have been boiled y'all, because <laughs> if we take a look at the Alberta commission on learning recommendations, uh, which is the Alberta organization that's supposed to define what are the biggest classroom sizes supposed to be. If we're talking about K through three, They've said the maximum class size should be 17 kids. If we're talking about K through six, the maximum class size should be 23. So if it was a, you know, grade three, that's still 
six over the maximum limit that's been set by the Alberta Commission. And if it was grade five, that is still the absolute maximum that's supposed to be in a classroom. And that's being celebrated as a low number. And I just really wanted to take a sec to like, let's just sit with that for a minute, because when the absolute worst case ceiling that has been defined as what should be allowable by, again, the Alberta Commission on Learning Recommendations, teachers are looking at that number and going, oh, thank God, it's only that. That's unbelievably screwed up. The frog is boiled. That 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 would be a dream class for for the year. That would absolutely. And that's so messed up because not only does that not serve teachers and let teachers do the jobs that they're supposed to do, but it also screws over the kids. And that's a really important part of the conversation that, again, when I look at the announcement that the, the, the UCP made about the capital funding, this does nothing to address the administrative burden that administrators and teachers have to deal with. This does nothing to address the classroom size piece, because unless you have teachers to put in those rooms with those kids, then you've got a room with, I don't know, 25 to 40 kids in it that don't have any sort of teacher supervision. That'll go super well. I mean, your brand new building will probably be burnt down in the course of about six hours, but uh to represent, and again, like I think that the ATA has done a good job in saying, thank, thank you, please, sir, may I have some more? Because this only solves a small part of the problem. This is only one small piece of the puzzle. And it certainly doesn't do anything to address the the classroom complexity piece. And that's where I wanted to, you, 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 you mentioned it earlier when we were getting into the charter piece and the, the private school piece. And I think it's really important to highlight a lot of people view classroom complexity as, um, and I choose my words carefully here, um, kids who require extra supports because of some form of disability. And it's not that. It's not just that. Because, I mean, here's... I'm going to get myself in trouble. Eh, that's what I do. Um, when I was going through the education system, personal anecdote, no empirical evidence whatsoever, so I'm just putting the context on that. But when I was going through the educational system, I was disruptive as all hell. Uh, for a whole list of reasons. But one of the biggest reasons why I was disruptive as all hell was because I was labeled. I love that they use the term diagnosed now because I think that it's so much more accurate. Um, but I was labeled as gifted. And so I was a, a nightmare to have in regular classes because I got bored so fast and so it's really important to highlight that when we're talking about the, the, the student complexity that exists in classrooms, it's not just the disabled kids, and I'm air quoting that, or the complex, you can't just say complex because I don't think that represents the full spectrum. There are also kids who are going to be disruptive by nature of the fact that the regular curriculum does not meet their needs because they're going too fast and so it's i, I really want to we did the conversation with hold my hand and we spent a lot of time talking about disabled kids and we're failing disabled kids no question but i do not like the notion that the the disruptors in class are being perceived as the disabled or lower functioning ones again air quoting that for the audience um because the ones that have the other end of the spectrum can be equally as disruptive. And there's nothing in this announcement that addresses either pieces on, on that end. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the classroom complexity that exists in the classrooms right now, because again, that's another piece where I'm, I'm very fired up over this because that whole hold my hand conversation that we had was just so heartbreaking and so horrifying um, and the notion that we should somehow be moving 
complex kids on either end of the spectrum out of the classrooms is to me harmful because it ostracizes those kids and it does not allow normal again air quotes uh, i'm air quoting a lot in this little rant um, but it doesn't allow normal kids the exposure to hey there's this whole diversity of humanity and why can't we all just get along so what are your what are you hearing about the the classroom complexity that exists in uh the classrooms this year so far are teachers being adequately resourced I think you know the answer to that. You know, it's it's funny. I need to answer this question under the the you know through the the lens of of moral uh, angst of our teacher. So as a teacher, um, you know, compassion fatigue. You're you're morally feeling a failure because at the end of the day, you I mean, again, you go to work and you want to help everyone, and and you can't. So you've got your you know, let's say we even have the 23 kids in the class, but they're grade ones. You know, you've got you've got the students who haven't learned how to school yet. You know, they don't understand that, like, you need to go and follow some rules and some time. Like there's expectations on on us as we learn how to exist in society that we don't interrupt and we we have to sit and be able to do attend to a task for a period of time. And, you know, we we eat at a certain time. And like it's it's like that society training, which however you look at it, those things, we have students who haven't learned that because they haven't, that they don't experience it at home. Um, it's not, you know, they do it differently at home and not, not right, wrong way. Um, and then you have the students who are, who are acting out and I'll say, you know what, that's a behavior and behavior is communication. So in, in, if you were in my class back in the day, um, I'd be sitting next to you. Unfortunately, I wouldn't be in front of the class, but, um, you know, you're, you're bored, you're communicating that I'm not getting what I need. I'm not getting um, enough work to do or not enough enrichment in the work that I'm doing that I'm like, I'm ready just to throw pencils at, at the window. And then there's students who have the same kind of responses and they're acting out and doing things because it's too fast. They're not understanding. They're not there. The communication is so, so all of those behaviors are communicating a lack of something. So needing to suss out what is that? So you've got the kids who are communicating for whatever reason, because they're not, their needs are not being met. And then you have students who, you know, they're there and they, they, their language, you know, English is not their first language. It, it takes a good five to seven years to really understand a different language and exist in it and, and to understand all of the complexities of it. So you have kids who've been here for two years or three years, they're still like, they're still missing things. You've got kids coming to school hungry. You've got kids coming to school and they, you know, shit's going on at home. And that you, you can't focus and do your work if you've got all of these other things that, that you're worried about, you're worried about mom or whatever it is. And, and you've got, you know, and you're worried about how kids look at you and you're worried about, you know, you, you have mental health concerns because you have anxiety because you can't have your phone anymore. And then you're wondering what someone said about you on Facebook. And all of these things are competing for this limited amount of time that you actually have to do the things that you need to do to check those things off. And, and so our teachers, the complexity is, I don't know how to work with a student with this specific need, or I don't know how to modify the work that I have to do, and it's all new curriculum in four different subjects, and I need to be prepared. And so I put the stuff together, but I bring it to school. And one thing we learn about as a teacher is like, if you if you get to teach the same lesson a couple of times, like if you're a junior high teacher, you, te you do the first lesson, we know practice makes perfect. And you're like, wow, that was a failure. Like I'm gonna have to readjust when I teach the next class. Well, if, if you teach everything in elementary school, you don't get do-overs. You don't get to teach it to the other group more likely. You just have to build and reflect and do better. And so, there are all these competitions for attention and time and and requirements and then and then everyone gets the flu or then you're sick or you're you know you, you've got elder care at home or your kids blowing out of their class and you whatever it is it it's just that all of these things compete and even if you have a, a pretty 
baseline class with not a lot of, you know, you don't have many medical issues that you have to make sure that your kids are, did you go and take your meds? Did you, you know, did you call your mom? Whatever. You still have so many things you have to do. So then when you add the complexities, as we have in our regular classrooms and programs now, then it, it's, it's just a lot. So even a little complexity makes it, it, it a bigger issue. And then you have programs that is all complexities. Like it's almost all your students are English as an additional language, plus medical, plus whatever, plus whatever. Um, what does it look like? And, and then think about the different parts in the city. We're a really big city and we have different schools and we have different areas. So if you work at a school, had a conversation with a, a, a principal last year as, as we were having all the overflow schools. So by the time, the, you know, mid-year, the school's full, there's no more kids, but people are still moving into the area because that's where there's rentals available. And then you go to the school and you want to register and they're like, oh, sorry, you have to go to the next school. The next school says, sorry, you got to go to the next school. So there's like the fourth school. And so this is an area of the city that like maybe has never had a refugee student because they don't live in the area or have very have not dealt with many students that have English as additional language, et cetera. And then you have a, a teacher population that most of them stay in those schools for years doing what they do every day and 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 then having to like, I don't know how to do this. I need to learn. I need to put the skills in my toolbox to be able to help these students because that is our job. So it's even a little can be a lot. Here's the, the there's, there's two big questions that I want to wrap up with because I know that, that I'm already pushing well past the, I mean, we're on an hour, almost an hour and a half in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The administrative burden piece huh? that has been a problem for longer than 18 months, correct? Correct. The classroom sizes piece has been a problem for longer than 18 months, correct? 100%. The student complexity. I mean, I'm old. So the fact that I was disruptive in my classes. We're I not 18 months old. So <laughs> we're going to go yes on that. Here's the the other part of that first question that I want to ask. Given that all of these problems haven't existed for longer than 18 months, I would argue four years in the vast majority of those cases. Is it safe to say that the problems are not a function of newcomers or immigrants or refugees, but rather the problems are a function of chronic underfunding under multiple governments going back decades. I couldn't have said it better, Nate. That's exactly the answer. How angry does it make you that the premier of the province is misrepresenting the causes of these problems? Because one of the things that I always go back to is like, yes, the first step of any problem is admitting that you have one, but the second step is defining it and the causes. And if we're not defining the the problem and the causes accurately, you can't fix the problem. Like if I have gophers coming up through my back lawn, which I do now this year, it's a very strange year. But if I have gophers coming up through my back, my back lawn and I go, oh, but that guy keeps parking out front of my house. I'm going to put up road spikes and that will solve the gopher problem. Most people would look at me and go, what? And it feels like we have a premier who's looking at chronic problems that have existed in the education system due to underfunding. And she's going, well, but let's blame the group we can punch down on. Unfortunately, we see it and we, we, it's it's not a new philosophy by by this government or this particular premier that it's easy to blame. But I also remember that I need to put myself forward, but then also do some jazz hands for my base over here so they know that I still got their back because November, beginning of November is coming. The other question that I wanted to ask you, because it was part of our conversation last time, is... Let's talk about the Parker for a second. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about the Parker for a second is because, well, Mr. Parker has gone on to greener, Tucker-filled pastures. He's 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 doing tour work for, for Tucker Carlson. I wish I was making that up, but it's it's the truth. I mean, yay, he's not in Alberta anymore, so that's good. But the work that he initiated and the the rhetoric that he initiated has been picked up and has been... The, the torch has been passed on uh, 
and there are groups that are still in that uh vein uh that want to do daniel smith's policies and much much worse in in public schools um they're still advocating for people to run for uh school board trustee positions in order to get rid of the gays or in order to get the pornography out of the schools it's not in the schools why do we have to keep saying that but that that group is still pushing forward that sort of rhetoric and that sort of narrative do you think that there's and here's the question part a lot of preamble on that. Uh, but do you think that there is a false sense of safety that has has sort of settled because David Parker has, thank God, left? Um, I mean, let's, let's make Denny safe again is all I'm saying. But uh, do you think that there's a false sense of security or do you think people still need to be engaged with the i mean we're only like a year and a half away from electing a whole new sl spate slate both probably of the school board trustees do you think that people need to continue to to have that level of engagement to ensure that the issues of administrative burden classroom sizes and student complexity and the underfunding of those things get addressed as sure. opposed to going down the fear-based non-existent narrative the work, I mean, has already started and it needs to continue until we get to the election. We know that school board trustee elections are the, the least sexy part of any sort of municipal election, which I give, you know, put to you is the least sexy of all of the elections. And so you, you know, we as teachers, as citizens, as people who know that you know, public education serves the public good and that we need strong totally accessible and and well resourced education and and we see that we, we need it to be overseen by people who are interested by the populace so having having our trustees being voted by the citizens and and knowing and being able to ask them where do you stand on this where do you stand on that and so those questions now we as a as a you know we're Nonpartisan at the ATA, despite what some of those groups think, we don't actually fund any political parties, so to speak, but we're not apolitical. We know that we need to be advocates to make sure that public education is funded and we need to talk with politicians of all stripes and, and put it out there. But you also need to be engaged in that, in that, you know, local piece. So we, and the structure that we have in like Calgary Public, you know, we we don't have direct connection with our with the trustees. And because as we're employees of the Calgary Board of Education, um, there are different processes. If we have an issue with with you know a policy, or if we have issues, we actually need to go to our our chief superintendent, or we need to you know put it up the chain. There, we're not as as employees. We don't have direct access to the the trustees. They because of the model of governance they work with the chief superintendent. The chief superintendent is essentially their one employee and then the chief superintendent does the work. So one of the things I'll, far, I'll start off by saying is that, you know, if, you know, cousin Davey thinks that they're going to come in and be part of the school board or friends of, you know, some MLA named Eric think that they're going to come in and take over parts of the school board and then and say, no, this is the policy that we're going to do They're I think they're going to be surprised that like, oh, well, I actually can't action these things that I think because they don't understand the structure. You know, we we want people who actually want to support public education in these roles, which means that we need to ask our friends and we need to, you know, elbow the retired teacher that we know that gets it to put their name forward and we need to let them know that we're ready to put up signs or whatever you need. I've got you. I'll make phone calls because no one's doing it for us. No one is coming to save us. That's, you know, we're, we're it. We're the people we've been waiting for to, to act and stand up for our profession and to stand up for, for the schools and the kids that we support. So I do think we can't let our guard down. I do think, you know, while, you know, our friend might be chasing Tucker around the world, um, there are still, unfortunately, groups of of 
people in that have these mandates to do things that I'm like, I'm like, why do you hate? Why, why do you like, what's wrong with you that you hate so much that you can't let someone be who they are. And, and, you know, I, I actually just had an argument on social media. Funny enough, that doesn't happen often. I usually stay away, but you know, someone was making a comment about, you know, well, we can't let our kids, well, I can't let my grandkids go to school where they can have a pride flag up for a whole week. I'm like, but we can have a celebration at Christmas for something that I don't believe in, but you, you can't have your kids know about something that you may not believe in. Like we need to see that there's everything out there and that we, we, and as I quote it from the program of studies, which is the curriculum in Alberta in social studies, that students need to learn and appreciate the diversity that is Canada, which involves identity, which involves traditions, actions, that make Canadian as a whole. And, and that includes everyone and not just the people that you don't want to see. So it's, I don't think we need, I, I think we need to keep going. I, I do think when it comes to the school board piece, we need to be engaged because we do, I think we do have a fight on our hands against people who don't necessarily have the best interests of everyone in, in the front of them. Do you think it would be fair to say, like, if somebody says, oh, I'm thinking about running for a school board trustee, do you think it would be fair to say to the to, to general Joe or Jane public um, who does not necessarily have to look like a middle aged white oil field worker? Hey, common ground thinking about you. Um, but do you think it would be fair to say if somebody comes to your door or to an event and says, I'm going to run for school board trustee, if they can't answer why administrative burden classroom sizes and student complexity are the number one issues facing our schools and instead want to talk about pride flags, that should in and of itself be disqualifying for that person as a candidate? I, I think so, but that's not how it works, unfortunately. But I, I would I would like and I believe we will have the opportunity, whether it's through, you know, local engagement or or panels or even just uh, let's send out a questionnaire and, and post the answers from the people that are running in different areas. What, where do you feel? It? And if, and as a citizen, if you read through and can read through some of the rhetoric that people might be spewing to say, whoa, that actually doesn't align with what, you know, we, we've had school board trustees in the past who have gone in with an agenda and, and they're not there anymore. But they're, they are premier of the province. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> I wish I was, though. Um, <laughs> anything else that you want to bring to people's attention? Anything else that you want to want to highlight, uh, Stephanie? Can I, can I be so bold and to to do a, a shout out as I look for and I can't find it. Um, we and there'll be advertisements coming, but um, we are bringing in Margaret Atwood to Calgary on November 12th um, at the state, uh, the Jubilee and tickets are like 30 bucks. They're super cheap because we just, we want to have conversations. So um, I, I put it out there that uh, check it out on Ticketmaster. And if, if you want to maybe draw a couple names for some free tickets or do something when we show, I can, I can, I got two sets of of two tickets each oh. that date. Oh, a giveaway, a breakdown giveaway. Oh, all I need is their at email address. So, oh, we're gonna have us a contest over here, folks. Okay. Um. Well, I think it's great that you're bringing Margaret Atwood to Cal to Alberta because in in so many ways Alberta is bringing Gil Aid to Alberta. So, uh, it 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 fits. I'm sure she'll feel right at home. Margaret Atwood, Christo Fascist. You know, it's not kidding. <laughs> And sadly that enough. joke shouldn't be topical. Damn it. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat uh, tonight. And I'm going to have to work. I'm going to have to go back to the team. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to, we're going to contest off um, a couple of, a couple of uh, sets of tickets. That's thank you very much for that. That's, that's super cool. Um, and yeah, uh, we will, for sure be talking with you again in the future because I feel like uh, if, and I'm just speculating here, if the problems of administrative burden classroom sizes and student complexity do in fact go back farther than 18 months, and if 
the announcement that was made about building school buildings and not having any funding for students and student supports and teacher supports and, 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 and. If those things don't solve all of the problems, we'll probably have some things to talk about in just a few months. We're always available. Thanks so much, Nate. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that's it for another episode of The Breakdown. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here, we would love nothing more than if you thought about signing up to be one of our Patreon sponsors at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab, where for just the price of a fancy cup of coffee a month, you can help us continue to produce this kind of content. Whether you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, in which case maybe leave a, a, a review and a rating or whether you're watching it on one of our streaming platforms we want to say a big thank you to everybody who is part of the breakdowns audience and as always take care of each other and keep the conversation going <laughs>